George just told me his whole life story, so I'm not sure where to begin. He's bored already. <laughs> <laughs> so, is this on? Can you hear me? I did not, or I did know and forgot because of my age, that you grew up in and around Sacramento, mm -hmm. didn't go to art school, ended up in Los Angeles working in an airplane factory, mm -hmm. and then, as you say, Robert Alexander and Wallace Berman walked into your life. So you want to talk about that a little? How much talk about something how else. Much, how much time do you have? About seven uh, years. Yeah. Well, that's how long, you know, they, it was a birthday, and birthday. someone uh, invited them, uh, and they walked in. Wally gave me a book of Thomas Merton's poems that, uh, Tears of a Blind Lion. Right. And on it he wrote, Have a Good Birthday, Wally B. And that was the beginning of many gifts that he gave me. And Bob Alexander uh, is really behind the Love Press. He was a printer, Prince as well right. as a poet, an artist, collage maker. Um, before assemblage, he made constructions. So these were the um, examples for me. I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. Right. You said you were looking at that point. Yeah, I was I was looking, and I was with Berman the night he hung his show at the Freres Gallery. I okay. helped him set it up, and to me, he turned an art gallery into a sh temple, into temple, a shrine. Temple, right. And before that, to me, art galleries were like shoe stores. You went to one for high heels, right, and right. another for flats. And, right. Um, I decided that's what I wanted to do with my life. And you were 10 years younger than them. You were like in your yeah, 20s, early 20s. All, all of the, uh, I'm now on all these panels about Cameron and Edmund Teske and Berman. And uh, they keep coming to me because I was 10 years younger. And that's why I'm here today uh, to say what was going on then. Right. As though I remember. <laughs> um, you can make it up. I will tell. Okay. Uh, All right. So you start making art. Just you just start one day. Like, hey, I'm gonna. Well, they were gifts. Play around. You know, I put L O V E on all my right. works, and that started then because I was making birthday presents, uh, a wedding, someone's wedding, and I found out the poetry I was reading was from that era, a shelf paper, 25 feet long, no punctuation, and when I would go to read that, just in a small living room at the Berman, I would have stage fright, heart palpitations, and there's no punctuation, no place right, to right. breathe. Uh, but I found out I could cut some of this out, paste it on uh, an what's now called assemblage, uh, take that and set it on the platform at a poetry reading. I could sit back in the audience and enjoy the evening. Right, right. That's, that's the birth of a plastic artist. So the other thing that I think this book makes clear is all the different ways you worked. Assemblage, now photographs, which you never showed before. Mm -hmm. that I know of, mm -hmm. drawings, mm -hmm. sculpture, mm -hmm. letterpress, and various other things. So it, it, right, it seems to me you never confined yourself to working in one way. Do you, all, you worked in all sorts of ways, which of course is what inspired me. Yeah, so, uh, well the autodidact has to learn everything. Uh, from scratch right. and so obviously the beach combing which is how the assemblage work started uh, everyone does that I saw in when I lived in Mexico City every taxi cab every bus driver had a little shrine up there look exactly like what Bill Sides later called assemblage and uh, so I would return to that, but I needed to find out uh, what was lithography, what was photography, what w every medium. Right. Uh, and I, I was interested in theater from a very young age. Age, right. You know, so uh, all of the things in filmmaking, I, I think if you're, and I, I sense that there's a whole generation of people just like me. 
right. there today right. that don't want to be the old Bing Crosby song, Don't Fence Me In, you know. Uh, well, my uh, yeah, well, it's also Baudelaire says it's pre- preferably being a man of the world than an artist wedded to his palate like a surf to the soil. Yeah. Right? Uh-huh. <laughs> That's lovely. So, in yeah. a way, I felt like when I first learned about your work and then I saw and came to your studio in LA and saw all the different mm-hmm. ways you worked, it was like, oh, this yeah. is like mm-hmm. every kind of way to make something becomes a way to make something, right? Mm-hmm. Except well, now I found out that you painted, which I didn't really know yeah, because no, you never so showed me those. Yeah, no, I kept them mostly in the family. Right. Uh, my granddaughter's here and I just sent your mother a picture I did when she was like six months old or something very young sleeping and um, and you learn to paint because this guy that you're living with right teaches you how to stretch a canvas Artie Richer was a uh, one of the original Ferris painters he and John Altoon I watched them work on a painting together uh-huh. one time and so in emulating these people and Artie was a uh, you know, he'd take me by the back of the neck and make me sit down and draw. He believed, right. he said, forget this assemblage crap, you know, it's never going to last. Uh, <laughs> what you need to do is learn how to draw and paint. And uh, so that's, I took his advice. So how did you meet Bruce Connors? Bruce Connors, okay. Um, I have to tell this story, I just told this to my friends. Bruce Conner, I had a, there was a photo of you without your shirt on, mm-hmm. and Bruce Conner said, oh George, he always had his shirt off, he just looked good without his shirt on, and then I realized that Bruce never, there's no photo that I know of Bruce without his shirt on. That's right. Mm-hmm. So, uh, anyway. Uh, well, he called me Nature Boy, too. <laughs> yeah, it was well, I, um, I was working in an aircraft factory in, uh, it's called Servo Mechanisms in LA, and my wife was working at a blue blueprint factory. She'd gone to college for 11 years, never got a degree, so we decided to go back to Berkeley. She would get a teaching card, and uh, then she would teach and I could paint. That, right. that was, was the plan. And so I got a job in paper editions, which is a time oh, I don't print- know, Printmaker, right? Is a printmaker? No, no. Paper editions is when people don't remember this, but there didn't used to be paperback books. Oh, right, right. And that was a revolution because paperback books meant that the masses that couldn't afford these hardcover prices could, could get it. And Norman Rose, who's a seminal figure in this whole scene, used to on his little uh, Indian motorcycle with the saddlebags go all over small towns in California, go to a drugstore, set up a rack, and all of a sudden you could have literature going out. So paper editions was the warehouse where all the paperback books went through. So uh, the people who were working there were incredible poets. Uh, David Meltzer was there. Right. Jim Newman, who opened the Ferris Gallery. Aya is another poet right. that was there. And Bob Alexander was the straw boss in the back. And I was in charge of receiving all these books that came in. The one hardback we got uh, by Love Possess, I hated that motherfucker because it weighed a ton. Man. <laughs> <coughs> and you had to... And then you would get from Tuttle, from this beautiful little box with all these haiku poetry. Oh yeah, sure. So working there was the, um, uh, and putting Polly through college, and then the Burmans decided to move up from Los Angeles, and they stayed with us. I had a 13 room house in Berkeley, and the Burmans stayed for a couple weeks and got a house on uh, Jackson Street in San Francisco. Two doors down is uh, Bruce, Bruce Connors. Right. Around the corner is Michael McClure and Joanne, Jada Fayo, Wally Hedrick. And right. so that's how I met. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. And that was before Bruce went to Brookline Mass and mm-hmm. did all the weird, or Newton Mass and did all the weird stuff. Yeah. Well, see, I thought Bruce was like a kook, a crazy person, because uh, Gene Connor did these exquisite collages, and Bruce is like taking a bucket of silver paint that he wants to throw over some of the, one of his pieces, and he misses, and so <laughs> silver paint went all over everything. So, uh, and he always was twitching and like this. I thought he was just the craziest person. He was. Yeah. Well, uh, lovable. He, he man- yeah, he managed to ride that craziness. I know. To the peak, and more and more as I look back. 
what a, a genius type in terms of film, uh, the drawing, everything that he did was so far in advance of where I was, as far as I was concerned, uh, and to this day. Right, right. Yeah. Bruce, I'm mentioning Newton Mass because he once told me that he lived with Tim Leary, which was a big eye opener as to mm -hmm. some aspect of Bruce's behavior. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, he asked me once how many peyote buttons I ne needed. Uh, you would eat these peyote buttons, and I said four. So the next thing I know, he's giving me little green buttons with a pin that you could put on. He said, <laughs> peyote. <laughs> and he, ga he gave me four of them. <laughs> and then you stayed in San Francisco for a while, but then you moved back to L.A. Yeah, the thing in California then, it was th there was no Mason-Dixon line between north and south. People went back and forth, back and forth, and it was just, you saw the same friends there. Right. And then once the children were born, you still did it, but once they entered school, yeah, you wanted them to have that uh, settle down, that neighborhood, right, right, experience. Uh, and that I happened to be in Topanga at right. that time. And that's where Wally lived at the same time. He was living in Beverly Glen. Right. He lived, and then his house went down the hill. Right. And then he moved to Topanga. Right. Yeah. And is that when you met Hopper and the other the actors? Uh, well, Those you know, funny child the, actors. I, yeah, uh, the first one was Bobby Driscoll in right. 1957 in Hermosa Beach when right. I was working at Servo Mechanisms, and through him I met uh, Dean Stockwell, another one, and Billy Gray, another child actor, and then uh, later on Russ Tamblin. Right. And at one point, other than Wally Berman, all my friends were child actors, and I thought, now am I an actor <laughs> pretending to be an artist? <laughs> or, you know what I mean? Right. I began to question that. And, uh, and you now do have done a book with Amber, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Amber's one of the love press things, and, and she's like another generation right. of uh, following Russell's uh, footsteps. Yeah. But the, the actors, uh, I think part of it, someone like Dean Stockwell had money so he could travel and he, could, and he was an angel and bought right, a lot yeah, of my work. Right, right. So I, I was uh, supported by them right. well, in big ways. And he also took a lot of photographs, is what I was told. That's right, yeah. Now, Dennis, when they did, the, uh, Lisa Phillips took the uh, Beat Culture Show, and I started here at the Whitney, and I traveled with that each stop. And uh, one of the one in San Francisco, Dennis was there, and Dennis was included as Beat Generation, and I, I questioned that. Right. And then we sat down at lunch one time and talked about it, and Dennis and I were in the same places, like when Berman and Alexander had the Stone Brothers uh, right. poetry readings, right. Alec Trokey read and Cameron and and Dennis and I were in the audience, audience but right. we were shy, right. if you can believe that. Um, and uh, I can believe that about you, but I'm not so sure about Dennis. Well, it, <laughs> I think the first job of all of us is to learn how to be an audience. Right. You know, that's it, and then then it f things proceed from that. And so Dennis and I were were audience. Uh, right. So he, he's a legitimate beatnik. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Dean is too in a way, but he sort right. of yeah. stepped back from it, you yeah. know, more. Yeah. Well, it's hard for him to get work as actors. When right. You know right. He's a beatnik. Uh, so I want to talk to you about this. Uh, box of drawings you did. The Schwabian, Swabian. Oh, the Sabian exercise? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, the Sabian exercise is a drawing a day for a year. Um, and I thought, I'd seen it in the Metaphysical Town Hall Library in San Francisco, and then I lost track of it. And finally in the back of a rug store in Tarzana, Anita Alexander had a little small occult bookstore. And there it was. And so I did a drawing a day based on these symbols, and at the end of the year, um, 
uh, under uh, what the way I did it is I would write you know print the symbol and then underneath there was like a two-line psychological interpretation this is like Dane Rudger right Dane Rudger yeah. wrote that well at the end of the year I met Dane Rudger and I said I think I, f I feel like I know you because I've been handwriting your words for a year <laughs> <laughs> and that same year he had been pissed off that he only was allowed two lines to do a psychological interpretation but so he wrote at length uh. about them and so it, it was a drawing exercise I missed 18 days you know and so the next year as the sun went through each of those right. things I filled in there was one day in September I don't want to know what day it was I missed four years in a row I was fucked up I don't know why I couldn't <laughs> do that so, um, so you do these projects like a drawing a day I remember at one point I went to your studio and you said you were going to make 365 clocks. Do you remember this nutty conversation? I don't r remember. I, I made because you uh, said Picasso had made something. Oh you yeah. Decided oh, oh yeah. You would do something similar. Yeah. Well, Picasso wanted to buy a house, so he did a watercolor of the house. He sold the watercolor and bought the house. Right. And I said, Hey, I ought to do that. So I made. It was actually 1985, and right. I made uh, 58 clocks that I was going to sell and then buy a house. Well, right. I think I sold three, maybe, or something, <laughs> but anyway. Ah, so you, but you, th I mean, just to kind of get this out there, you set yourself up to yeah. do these things where you make a huge yeah. number of pieces, or a number of pieces, mm -hmm. not necessarily huge. Well, it's theme and variation, right? you know, and I get it from the jazz musicians, right. uh, their ability to play the same song over and over, but it's different right. each time, you know, so... And did you listen a lot of music when you were in California, when you were in L.A.? Yeah. I mean, that's where there's a great jazz scene. Well, the, the jazz scene, see, was both New York and Los Angeles. Same musicians worked both places. places right. So Bird is in L.A., uh, went to Camarillo. Um, so uh, 1957, I'm in the front row at the Lighthouse right. every night because I was working a day job. Um, and that, uh, just like last night, I met Smalls with Sue in the front row. Right. So if, if you want to know the secret, the secret to be sitting in the front row at a jazz club every night, and you'll end up here. Right. Uh, <laughs> in this chair. And you also, I mean, Berman also knew a lot of musicians because yeah. he knew the, ro the Stones and this whole scene with that. And Connor knew all these people. Right. So there's this funny porous thing between actors, musicians, and mm -hmm. artists, and poets mm -hmm. that seems now to be more ghettoized, I would say. Unfortunately, yeah, but I, I think there's a, the younger generation coming along that uh, I was going to, they wanted a project when I went to Austin last week, and I said, well, I'll do, and it was ab about collaboration. I said, okay, I'd like to collaborate with a fictitious artist. And this is someone that does drawings and paintings and theater pieces and movies and music. And, you know, I just ran that. Right, right. It was a found thing. That's right. a description of some of a contemporary artist, artist yeah, a younger right. artist. Right. So, I, I I think there's a, a, a breadth of horizontality going on amongst the young people. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah. So do you think we should let the audience ask us questions? Yeah, the, I'm, allowed, I'm allowed one straight answer. One straight answer. So, yeah. allowed one straight you, are, answer. Uh, you don't get it. It's not, no, no, not no, for no, you, no. Tom. Yeah. Uh, you get the one insult. I get the one insult. The one insult. Oh, we, that's we're allowed. Great. Yeah. Just, I, so I signed great. a contract. Yeah. <laughs> Does anyone want to ask yeah. a question of this lovely man? They don't get fresh. <laughs> <coughs> no, see, that was, that was now see, that shut everybody yeah. up. <laughs> well, did, did Disney yes. have any uh, role for you? Walt Disney, uh, did, did that? infiltrate your thinking in any way? As a human being, not as an artist, as a human being, that whale in uh, Pinocchio that went through, <laughs> I lived my life that way. You know, everything that came along, drugs, you name it, I just threw it in. Um, but uh, because he bought uh, that art school, Chenard, and moved it out and, and it was renamed Cal Arts because he wanted animators, you know, uh, there was a, a, 
a strange odor to, to Disney as I mature. Uh, but as a child, I bought every single one of those, you know, Fantasia, all, all the animated things. I bought everything as a child. I believed everything. Well, you know, there's a, there's a Disney product, a woman, Miley Cyrus, mm. who now has entered the art world in right. a way where she's making a similar some sculptures, law. she called them, mm -hmm. where she found shit and put more shit together, mm -hmm. and it made her happy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there seems to be some endorsement mm -hmm. of her, mm -hmm. at least in New York, mm -hmm. as, as a legitimate mm -hmm. well, I think an artist. I, I just mm -hmm. wonder what your thoughts might be about that. Uh, I don't think it depends where it comes from. I mean, lightning strikes, and, and, and someone, it's like, you know, on the road to Damascus, well, now it's like, a, you know, a jackknife truck on the 405 or something. It, it can hit anyone, any time. I think the openness is what, in the times that I've been a teacher, I've always tried to encourage that openness to the accident. Let's see what happens. Yeah. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Don't be shy. Mm. Okay, so... <laughs> and now you don't even live in Los Angeles, so live in Irvine. I live in Irvine. You want to know why? <laughs> they ask me, why do I live in Irvine? And I point to Sue, and Sue says, well, it all started in Michigan. That's where Sue was born. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, no, Sue was the registrar in 1979, my very first retrospective at the Newport Harbor Art Museum. Uh, okay. And she had to do the condition report about all my junk sculptures. Oh she had to go over every square inch. And yeah, this thing that was run over in the street, the artist likes it that way. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, and so we were friends, right. very intimate then, and friends all along, and then a few years ago I was giving a talk in a home in, in Irvine, and the woman knew that Sue, being next to the university, rented out rooms to students. She said, Sue, would you take George home so he doesn't drive all the way back to L.A. with a lot of wine? Did you finally get your license, by the way? Did I what? Did you finally get your license, by the way? For what? For driving. Oh, I thought you meant my poetic license, because that was revoked, you know? Yeah. I know. Uh, no, I did, yeah. You did? I did, yeah. Ah. All of that stuff is behind me now. He once told me as we were driving through Los Angeles <laughs> in your pink green Volvo, he said, uh, I, I never get in trouble when I drive in Los Angeles. I said, why is that? He says, because I don't have a license. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, oh. Yeah. Okay, no, George. I'm, I'm completely <laughs> licensed now. Um. And we didn't get arrested. I think we, we did not get arrested. There's someone in the crowd. Yeah, there's someone in the crowd tonight. <laughs> that uh, as we were leaving the Palomino, which was the Cowboy Bar uh -huh. in L.A., and we're going down the famous Van Nuys Boulevard. Used to hot rides used to race up and down it, and you would roll a window down and say you want to go for yeah, pink right, slips, right. right? Well, we went for pink slips, and I got away with the cops popped him <laughs> and he's never forgiven me I bet he has <laughs> yeah, I, but, but we're still there's still time left yeah you know, okay uh, and uh, he's going to catch me behind the wheel one night yeah. 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 and where's the book you where's the book? the book here's the book you guys here's have to book. buy copies yeah, I'm the, the book. bookshelf here's the bookshelf and it's two volumes yeah two volumes the river book um, Which is great. <sighs> and it shows every kind of work you've done, more or less. Well, it was a, there was a working title once called Pearl Tips. Pearl because that's what you want to turn every irritation into. And tips because of the tip of the iceberg. Right. It's like Batman Gallery's the first chapter, 77 works in that exhibition. We could only do 30 pages. Right. And then we had to go through decades, you know, so it's just the tip of the iceberg. So Batman's that's run by the Dun Robert Duncan, right? No, no, oh, it no. was run by Billy Armar. Oh, that's It that okay. comes out of uh, Garment Center money right, here right. in New York. Yeah. Um, because he also knew Duncan and Jess. 
their gallery, what was that called? Ubu Roy. That's right. Ubu Roy, yeah, they had a gallery, Ubu Roy. So Ed Ruscha, Ed Ruscha has bought my work over the years. I would pull up with a car and open the trunk and he would pick something out and, and you know, and I think he finally got tired of that. He owned a lot of it, you know, so f he finally said, George, uh, would you like to make a book? Uh. Red meat in front of a shark. Yeah. <laughs> And so then the question was, what kind of book? Right. And we both agreed that it should be a beautiful book. Good. And so yeah, there you is. have the results. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And George, what kind of involvement did you have with the actual layout of the book and decision-making processes um, for the design elements? Well, I laid it out on Sue's living room floor, one chapter at a time, because the hardest part was there are facing pages, and so that means these works of art have to live together for eternity. So that was the tough one. Uh, and then we went into what we call the valley of low resolution. Yay, though I walked through, and we couldn't <laughs> find photographs. A lot of these things don't exist anymore. That's what's beautiful about this book. It was not tied to an exhibition. It, I could just, if something only existed as a photograph, then, you know, we could uh, still use it. And uh, uh, Lorraine Wilde is the designer, head designer at Green Dragon, and uh, she and I have worked on other books, and she's the, the genius of the design of it. My thing was mostly just making sure that the facing pages worked. And then with the title of the book, I left it open because I figured it would come out of Dave Hickey's essay. And sure enough, in the very first sentence, the river, and I said, that's it. So this is a river of art that flowed through me all these years. And, and the result, I mean, I look at these things, and uh, uh, here in Birdland, they used to be recording one night, and Pee Wee Marquette is a midget announcer, would say, well, we're recording tonight, and this, these, you applaud these artists, you may be somewhere, and you'll hear this recording, and you'll say, that's my hands on that recording. And so I look at these things and I say, hey, I was there when that was made. <laughs> what a lucky cat I am. <laughs> well, were there any other audience questions this evening? Yeah? All right, well, we want to extend a very warm thanks from both George and John for joining us tonight. Let's give them a round of applause.